Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a very warm welcome to the Reinvention Laboratory. I can't believe this is already our last day in this laboratory and we have had a very interesting and uh, I think very inspiring week in this, uh, yeah, in this arena here so far. I'm Corinna Egra, I'm your host throughout this Reinvention Lab and uh, I have the uh, pleasure to now welcome you to our well, first session of the last day, and it's on safety, future, and standardization. We do have an exciting session ahead, I'm sure about that. And I now have the pleasure to introduce to you Michael Balfus. He is a publisher at International Data Group Business Media, and he is now going to take over hosting the session from me. Thank Michael, the much. floor is yours. Thank Welcome you. Welcome on morning. stage. Thank you very Good much morning. for the introduction. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. How are you? How are you this morning? Great, great to have you here. For, for me, it's the first time here on that stage. Um, and uh, I, I like the format a lot, so it's, it's nice. You know, you're very close um, as this arena format. Um, we find this everywhere now uh, when, when, when we look at how events develop and so. Um, it's, it's, a new, it's a new craze. Everyone is building arenas. Um, but it's good, you know, it's good because it gives you more access to what's going on here on stage. And I'm very much looking forward to interact with you as, as, as good and as intensively as we can. Um, so I, I, do, I hope we can make it in a way that this is not only, you know, we speak here on stage and you listen, um, that, uh, that you lean in and, and that we really come to a, to a uh, scenario in which we interact and discuss the topics. The topics, safety, future and standardization, are obviously hot topics. And, and I can promise you, as said before, that we have put together a really great program uh, to address many of the various uh, elements and perspectives that are important when it comes to safety, future and standardization. And we are living in a world and in a time of really big game changes in this respect. I think one of the key game changes that we all have on our mind is the digitization. Um, it's everywhere. Um, we are living in a mobile world, you know, nothing remains where it is, everything is in motion all the time. We are in motion, our devices are in motion. Um, data is obviously, you know, one of the, one of the key phrases uh, of these days and years is that data is the new oil. You might have heard of that, so this is the real game changer in many industries, is creating, is, is getting data, gathering data, understanding data, uh, producing better products and services from and with data. Um, everything is connected. We are now talking about billions of individuals on this planet which are connected and trillions of devices. The number of devices that are connected are outpacing the numbers of individuals on this planet massively. Um, so this is really a scenario, this digitization scenario is really urging us, forcing, forcing us to rethink standardization. Um, and this is not only something that we are urged to and forced to, so something that might you know, come with a negative tonality, um, but also a massive opportunity, um, a massive chance to reach out to millions of people, which, or billions even, which have not yet participated or benefited from standardization. Now we can reach them. We can make products smarter. Products which are, you know, think of cars, of your mobile phones. I need to switch off mine, by the way, at that, at that moment, you know, before it rings, because, you know, I'm also connected all the time, so we need to switch it off. Please switch off yours as well, or, uh, unless, unless you're not using it uh, to, to uh, you know, send some tweets out or do some Facebook posts. Or so this is obviously what we want from you, you know, to spread the message. Um, but um, uh, otherwise, I, I obviously want, want to have your attention here. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is really an interesting, an interesting uh, topic and, and, and set up, and as I promised, we have an outstanding program um, uh, created for you. This is, we will have three speakers here on stage and a closing panel with all of these three speakers, and I, I really appreciate that all three speakers have decided and managed to be here for the full session, to not leave after their speech, but stay here, uh, follow the discussion and, and be open for your questions and even for our closing panel. Um, we have a three-time Paralympic gold medalist with us here today. So really an outstanding personality from Paralympic sports. Three-time gold medalist. She reigned, so to say, she reigned uh, the water for 12 years. Uh, Kirsten is here. Kirsten Brun, welcome. Good morning. Great to have you here. Um, 
she rained the water from Beijing to, no, you started not, in Athens, from Athens to London, uh, from Athens to Beijing to, to London, yeah. So for 12 years, she rained the water um, uh, and won three uh, gold medals in 100 meter breaststroke, I, I understood, okay, uh, which is obviously an outstanding, an outstanding uh, achievement. And, um, and we thought it's great to have you here because um, uh, the perspective of people um, with um, um, uh, disabled people is extremely important in this, in this, uh, um, in, in this topic and, and we will have a conversation on this later. We also have a robo-psychologist with us here today, Martina. <laughs> Martina Mara, welcome, good to have you here as well. Um, Martina will be our first speaker, so we do not jump into what we want to discuss right now, so I will, I will get you on stage in a minute and then, and then we can start. Um, and we also have um, a guy here which is, um, who, is, who is one of the leading experts in cybersecurity. And I can promise you this is also a very interesting topic of what we will talk about, Sandro Geiken. Uh, Sandro, hello, good morning. Great to have you here as well. Cybersecurity, you know, it's a frightening topic, so to say, um, because we will, we will have a little deep dive in what's going on in this cyberspace and what risks and challenges are waiting there for all of us. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure this will also be a very interesting part, part of, of uh, today. So, as I said before, this should be a dialogue. Um, we'll have Q&A sessions after each, uh, after each uh, uh, keynote. And please, so lean in, lean into the session, you know, um, and not only enjoy, but lean in, participate, contribute, um, and, and then it will be a great one. So I, I talked a little bit about the, the mega trends, and before we, we jump into our first, our first um, uh, keynote, I will give you a, a visual uh, feedback, so to say, and, and I would like to ask the technical guys to switch over to my to my iPad now, I hope it works. The iPad works. Question is whether the connection works. This is always a question. The single device always works, you know. The interesting question is, will it connect? <laughs> Do you get it? I, I, I may, whoops. Maybe I need to help them. Oops. So it should work now. Here we are. Ah, perfect. Great. So, as I said, work in a digital world. I need to... Ah, okay, so here we go. Perfect. This is... You know, I need to double check here with the, with the screen, but looks good. Yeah, can, can you see it? You can see it. This is good. Um, okay, so this graphical recording I would like to uh, guide you through a little bit for a few minutes is um, is a result of a workshop that happened a few months ago um, when several hundreds of um, um, s experts in occupational safety and health gathered in Dresden here in Germany it was in March and um, I had the opportunity and pleasure to moderate one of the sessions that happened there and this session was about the work in a digital world and we gathered for for two or three days even, and discussed really intensively about the multiple challenge and various aspects and elements of what is changing in the work, in the, in the way we work um, by digitization, this work in a digital world. And, um, and this graphical recording here, um, which is, by the way, a great format to, to, um, um, to sum up results in a graphical way, um, I would, like to, I would like to use this to set the stage a little bit and, and, and run through with you only, only a little bit. So I think one of the key points that is really important is that we are talking about an ongoing transition here. Digitization is a transition. There is no start or finish. You know, unlike most of the other big developments that we have experienced in many respects over the last centuries and, and decades, and so uh, this is not going to stop. It's only a journey, and the journey has just begun, and, um, and I think we, we will explore today with the, with the keynotes uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to 
and with um, the discussion, uh, we will easily explore that this is a transition which have only just begun. We are at the very beginning, and we need to we need to establish a mindset um, that um, uh, we are ready to deal and cope with all the things that are coming there. Um, and you obviously uh, see keywords here that we all uh, that we see all around us all the time. Industry 4.0. Um, uh, we are talking about uh, the interconnection uh, between machines. Um, as I said before, trillions of devices are connected now and, and will be connected in the future. Um, and everything um, that we see in, in the way we work is about to change. Um, we have new ways of work. The time and places where we work, when we work, is changing. We obviously lead, need no, uh, new uh, skills. Um, this is uh, uh, in an ex extremely important point. Um, we have um, new ways of relationships, um, interpersonal relationships. Uh, many of us from time to time feel lost in information um, because the information is so overwhelmingly, uh, so much of it. Um, we always have to have in mind that there are also new risks that will be generated from the digitization. The big brother um, picture um, is, is always in front of us, obviously. Um, I, I remember, you know, when, when I remember the workshop that from, from which we created this um, graphical recording, I remember that leadership was one of the hottest topics we, we talked about um, and one of the most controversial topics uh, as well. And I personally think uh, it is one of the really key points we have to have in mind that it takes a new type of leadership if we want to navigate successfully through the digitization. Um, and we need to establish this open mindset, a pos positive attitude uh, to all the changes. Uh, I think this is uh, so important, and I'm very happy that this is also an important point here on this, um, on this graphical recording. Um, if we move forward here uh, through this, um, we see a lot of aspects and elements that we will, um, that we will uh, explore deeper today. I think the topic of artificial creativity is also a very a very interesting element when we when we when we think about what machines and robots um, can do for us and with us uh, then we regularly and traditionally we think about relatively you know easy things which are not very complex and which will not take really creativity but we are at the brink of a development in computing power um, that will um, give computers the opportunity to really become creative and and create ideas and and this is the next big, big revolution um, in, in the way how we uh, use machines, how we interact with machines, and what machines can do for and with us. Um, they will be able to manage human-like complexity, and in many respects, eventually, they are already able to manage human-like complexity. Um, all of these things are leading to goals, um, to goals which we have identified um, that are directly um, connected to the topic of safety and health at work. It takes this leadership uh, training as a key point. We need to think about software and how we work with uh, software. Ergo ergonomics is an extremely important point. Usability and design for a, for a good usability. Um, we need... Um, uh, we need to uh, involve the young people, the young generation. We are talking about uh, the digital natives all the time, and these digital natives are a great opportunity in this respect because they are already uh, an integrated part of this digital world, and, and we should make them and look, need to look for ways to make them active stakeholders um, in this process of rethinking and reinventing standardization. And this will lead to new business models, to uh, new ways of managing content and getting content across uh, to the audiences that we want to reach. Um, we, will, uh, um, we will find ways to deal with the speed of change, which is enormous. Um, we will not only um, involve, we do not have to only involve employees, 
We also have to involve freelancers in many organizations and many companies. The share of work done by freelancers is growing rapidly, and so we need to make them part of the occupational safety and health uh, aspects as well. And, and all of that, again, uh, obviously needs strong leaders. And I think this conference here is a conference in which many leaders are gathering. So therefore, I think this is a very important message that we want to bring across from here, that this is maybe not only, but first and foremost, a, a leadership issue. Um, we are also talking about revolution in tools. Um, we can now find ways to integrate operational safety and health uh, occupational safety and health into the product itself, make the product smarter. Um, we can embed safety. Um, we can uh, use robots, obviously, to let them work in particularly risky situations. Um, and we can establish a new type of knowledge management in which we are able to find the information, to gather the information, and get it across to the person that are actually using a tool in exactly the right situation when the person needs the information to prevent an accident or something like this. And in all of that, um, robots and machines that are interacting with us, robots come in many ways and with many faces to us. Not every robot that we are interacting with um, is looking like that. Um, this is a wide variety on how robots look these days and how they act uh, with us these days. And, but robots are a very obvious and very central element to all of that. And therefore, I'm very happy that we can start the session today and we can switch back to, to the other screen if we want. Um, that we have our first um, uh, speaker today um, and, and she is a uh, distinguished expert in robotics, so to say. And this is Dr. Martina Mara. Um, I'm very happy to have you here. Please join me on stage, Martina. Good morning once Thank again. You. Great to have you. And, and you, you're working with uh, Ars Electronica. Ars Electronica is a research institute um, and uh, I, I, I consider this a think tank, yeah, so to is. say. Um, and, and you, you're, you're touching a very important perspective on all of that, and this is the intersection between arts, technology, and society. And I think this is a very uh, unique and special view on it. You're working closely with large organizations, with large companies and enterprises, um, doing great research work, and, and we are very curious to find out what you do. And, and what are the key findings from your, from your side are. But before I leave you uh, with the stage, I want to find out a little bit more about your particular role, because on the website, I learned that you are a robo-psychologist. True. And this is, uh, this is an interesting uh, job description, so to say. Uh, completely unique, I've never heard that before. <laughs> so what, what do I have to imagine about your, daily, about your daily work? Do you take care of robots that need therapy? Yeah, it sounds like that. Uh, <laughs> the image that most people uh, get in their minds is that I have very human-like robots lying on a sofa and I need <laughs> to treat them because of their very problematic robot childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's the other way around. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really don't care about the well-being of robots, uh, but I care a lot about um, the well-being of users and interaction partners of robots, yeah. um, who is a growing number, or that is a growing number of people, yeah. obviously. And I think this is also um, what I learned, a key point of your research work is around this topic. And, and can, you, <laughs> can you give us a, a, little, a little insight on on uh, do we as humans in Europe maybe in particular, in Germany, do we uh, hate us or do we love us of robots? Um, as always in psychology, I have to say it depends. Mm -hmm. um, we love and we hate robots. We have a very ambiguous relation to autonomous machines. But uh, maybe I, I can show um, the results of a very interesting um, survey that was conducted uh, by the European Commission. In 2012, um, they asked nearly 27,000 uh, Europeans um, on their attitudes towards robots. They asked really the broad public, you know. And I think uh, the results um, reflect 
uh, quite nicely how how uh, the question whether we like or hate robots also depends on different factors, such as the, the area of usage, for example. Um, if you look in this question particularly, um, the European Commission asked people in which areas they want robots to be used as a priority. And uh, what people s said um, mostly was things like space exploration. You know, space exploration, I mean, this is like sending robots as far away as possible, yeah? There's no further away like that. Mm -hmm. Please, away with these robots. <laughs> um, and if we look into areas that are very close to the core competences of us hum human beings, when it comes to empathy, to care, um, to um, the care of children and elderly, to mm -hmm. education, um, Europeans are still very much skeptical about that to apply such social roles um, to robots. Yeah. But if it comes to manufacturing, if it comes to production, to assembly, um, to robots at workplaces, like manufacturing was, was the second name answer here, mm -hmm. um, luckily this is an area that is accepted quite well. I think this is pretty much a traditional view yeah. on where robots uh, are about to be used and where yeah. they're used so far. Um, but, you know, if you look at the very bottom end, education, yeah, exactly. percent, this is where the creativity comes in. So this is obviously well. something that uh, we, need to, we need to explore deeper. And I think yeah. this is the scope of your, of your keynote, your presentation. We are really very much looking forward to it. Your stage, Martina. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Um, yeah, I don't have uh, that much time, but I want to give you some insight into um, what psychology uh, could contribute to human-robot collaborations at work. Um, first of all, I want to give you a number. Um, just a few days ago, the International Federation of Robotics released their new World Robotics Report the World Robotics Report 2016 and uh, the International Federation of Robotics, they always in these reports give estimations about numbers, about how many robots we're going to use within the next few years. And uh, quite interestingly, they um, estimate that by 2019, we're going to have 1.4 million more robots in industry, used in industry and production um, than now. Uh, the number they released for robots in usage in industry by 2016, by now, is 1.2 million. This means within the next two years, we're going to have a double amount of robots um, based on this estimation. What they also state in this report, and um, it's really quite interesting to look into the report more deeply, so um, maybe the ones of you who are very much interested in that topic, you could Google uh, for this report. What they also say is that based on these technological trends, companies within the next few years, they have to concentrate or they will be concentrating on simplified applications to make the usage of applications simpler on lightweight robots, but also on the collaboration of human and machine. They even sa said um, this will be the most important market driver to work on good ways of how humans and robots can collaborate, can team up. So this is a crucial question, how to do that. And, um, yeah, obviously the question is how, how we can foster very efficient teamwork between humans and robots, how this teamwork can be safe for the human co-workers, but also how we can make this collaboration with autonomous machines acceptable so that we feel well in coexistence with the robots at our workspaces. And this is where psychology could play a main role, you know. There are different approaches how to address this question and I want to um, show two approaches that um, go a bit in the direction of visual and behavioral design of robots. Um, there's one, I would call it humanoid approach. There are roboticists, there are developers that say, who say, um, in order to establish an efficient and well-accepted human-robot collaboration, we need to design robots in a way so that they imitate human beings for several reasons. Because, for example, the environments in which we work 
our job environments. They are basically made for human beings. So for a robot to coordinate, to navigate within these environments, it would be good if the robot has the same you know, body um, functions as a human being. But another argument that I hear very often is that um, humans would instantly and intuitively know how to communicate with their co-workers, with their robotic co-workers, if they look like and behave like humans. And what many roboticists think is that they would also like it more, because we human beings, we like to communicate with other human beings, we like to interact with people. So if a robot looks like a human being, then we would like it. Um, and this is a point where psychology is a bit skeptical about. Uh, I just quickly want to show you, um, I want to introduce you to the geminoids, to some, you know, some roboticists, they exaggerate this humanoid approach and uh, really go into the direction of, of android robotics, which means uh, to build robots that imitate, that mimic uh, human beings visually and behavior-wise as much as possible, uh, so that uh, in the future we could not even distinguish anymore between real humans and artificial humans, so to say. And this is a picture of uh, a family portrait, I would say, of, of the geminoids of android robots that are created by Hiroshi Ishiguro, um, a long-term collaborator of mine. I respect him a lot. He's uh, very provoking. He's a professor at Osaka University in Japan. Uh, he's the one in the middle, the left one in the middle, and um, he started to, to create Android robots based on uh, really existing people. He started by recreating himself as a robot. Um, and just to give you an idea how far these developments have come, I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, the latest um, Geminoid, the Geminoid DK, which mimics um, Danish uh, professor Henrik Schafer, and in this video you see mimical tests. Okay, um, just, uh, just to give you a very quick idea. Um, and as you see in this video, um, you know, the mimics and the realism of, of these Android robots is quite convincing already. So uh, this one, Geminoid DK, already manages to trick people for up to three seconds. You know, up to three seconds, people, especially the ones that are not very much experienced with technology or robots, um, they would already think that this is a real human and this is a tremendous, uh, yeah, um, result, success, so to say. Um, but I don't know how you feel when you watch such a video, when you, when you look at such a highly realistic uh, humanoid robot. Um, I can show you a screenshot of uh, very typical um, user reactions to Android robots like the Geminoid DK is. So this is actually, uh, these are some typically YouTube comments um, that were yeah, users commenting on exactly the video um, that I showed you. And, you know, people say things like, um, that makes me so scared, you know. They even uh, go very explicitly uh, by kill it with fire. Um, they say they fear that they cannot sleep anymore. And I think these, uh, if you look into these uh, comments by people, People, they already reflect quite, um, quite well um, our archaic fears towards autonomous machines or artificial human beings. You know, these are fears that we're going to be replaced, controlled, dominated by these technologies. And what people also state quite often is that they find these robots scary or creepy or eerie. Creepy, especially. Maybe you had similar feelings when looking at a video. Um, and this phenomenon, yeah, that we find highly human-like robots, eerie, creepy, scary, frightening. This has a name, it's called the uncanny valley phenomenon, and I studied it 
it uh, quite a time. The uncanny valley, the yeah, the creepy valley, um, a concept that was um, established by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori in 1970 already. And just to give you a quick idea what it's about, it's about the relation between the, the level of human likeness of a um, artificial character and the emotional response by people. So on the X axis we have the grade of human likeness, on, on the Y axis we have the emotional response from very positive to very negative. And uh, basically it says that uh, raising human likeness is actually a good thing, but only up to a certain point. When a robot, when a machine becomes highly realistic, nearly perfectly human-like, such as the Android that we've seen in the video, for example, but not perfect, then the acceptance drops um, tremendously. And we're going to perceive this um, machine as creepy, as frightening. Um, and the mechanism behind that is, um, this is what research um, has uh, found out so far that, um, you know, it's very much about the conflicting cues that we get, that our brains get uh, by watching such a robot. Uh, on the one hand side, uh, it obviously looks like a human being, but on the other side, we know it's a robot. So this is conflicting cues and we don't know what to expect from this machine. And this is probably the mechanism behind this uncanniness, this eeriness. Um, yeah, just to give you a quick background about um, yeah, psychological aspects of very human-like robotic co-workers. Obviously, we don't have these problems with uh, the visual appearances of most industrial robots. Yeah, most industrial robots are robots at workplaces that we have now and that we're going to have within the next um, one or two decades. Uh, look more like this example. Typically, industrial robot it has a mechanical appearance, is clearly categorizable as a machine, which is very much important from a psychological viewpoint already. The typically industrial robot is highly specialized for special tasks and, by definition, has three or more axis directions of motion, of autonomous motion. Um, and saying that, there are other things that needs to be um, thought of from a psychological viewpoint. Um, if a robot, even if it looks very mechanical, but if it can autonomously move through the space, uh, then this can be, again, a bit frightening for human co-workers if they are not able to predict the motion of the robot, or if the robot uh, cannot um, communicate he its next steps to the human co-worker. If we cannot make inferences about the intentions and goals and actions of the robot, we don't know whether maybe uh, its next motion will be <laughs> this one. So we cannot establish trust and we don't feel safe um, working together with this robot. So. Um, a very important issue here with um, most industrial robots um, currently and in the future is that we have to design robotic motion that is predictable, that is um, legible for human co-workers. And there's a very nice experiment done by uh, some colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University that I quickly want to introduce because I think it's quite relevant. In a, a lab experiment, they set up a kind of shared workspace between a robot, which you see on the left side, and uh, human participants. And um, they said that the task they have to team up for is um, they have to fulfill tea orders. Like it was a, it was a kind of coffee shop, a tea shop scenario. <coughs> the robot had dedicated tasks and the human had dedicated tasks. The robot had to grasp a certain cup and hand it over to the human. And based on the color of the cup, the human participant had to fill in the ingredients for the tea order, for the tea. Um, and they, in, in this experiment, they compared three types of pre-programmed robotic motion for this collaboration task. Uh, they compared a functional motion um, functional motion is a sample-based program that, um, which 
only goal is to um, not produce any collisions. So sometimes the functional motion can, can look a bit uh, weird. <coughs> The second motion they programmed and compared was a very efficient one, you know, the quickest way to the goal, the quickest way to the next cup. And the third motion they programmed was the uh, predictable motion, meaning not the most efficient, not the quickest way, but making it legible for the human coworker, announcing the direction that the robot would take. And the results are really interesting because um, which you probably don't, would not think, um, is that not only subjective well-being uh, was influenced by these uh, different um, motion programs, but also the total task time, uh, even the efficiency of the whole human-robot collaboration was best with the predictable motion, even if the predictable motion was not the quickest. But as the human coworker could predict, could estimate what the robot would do next, the co-worker could already start earlier with his or her preparations for the task. So the total task time was reduced. And also the subjective results, uh, the subjective ratings um, by the human co-workers were very clear and very interesting. They very much preferred the predictable robot motion over the other two types. So these are very interesting results. Um, and <clears throat> at the Ars Electronica Future Lab, um, as was introduced already, we um, have many research collaborations with industry. For example, I, um, I'm working with Mercedes-Benz on human uh, car interaction, interaction with autonomous cars, robot cars in the future. And we got similar results in um, in a very applied, very hands-on um, experiment uh, that we set up together with Mercedes-Benz on the interaction with autonomous robots. Uh, we set up an experimentation field where we used autonomous drones um, as kind of representatives for autonomous robots, mobile robots. And we looked into, we, sim we tried to simulate um, relevant traffic scenarios, you know, uh, relevant interaction scenarios in the future um, between autonomous robots and human beings. And for example, what we did, we set up a simulation scenario where um, participants who came to the experimentation field had to cross the flight path of the mobile drone. And um, as you can see in this picture, you know, they had to cross the flight path and they had to grasp a little box and then get back. Um, and again, in this experimentation field, uh, we compared uh, different settings, different conditions. I'm going to show you a quick video of that. Um, we compared one condition where the human being had to cross the flight path and the drone would not give any signal, would not give any proactive communication, would not give any prediction about whether it would stop. No signal, you know. Um, as you see here, I mean, for sure, you know, the technology has to work. For sure, the drone has to stop and has to break for the human being. That's clear. But <coughs> If the human being has no signal, doesn't receive any signal by the robot, that it has been recognized, that it has been seen, that the drone will break in time, that it will stop for him or her, then that's a bit weird, you know, that feels a bit un unsafe. So this was uh, the comparison between no signal, between light signals, and we implemented very basic light signals based on, on traffic lights with green and red um, LED lights, uh, which already made uh, quite a difference for our participants. And the third condition um, was to still give human beings the chance to actively 
control the robot. You know, I think this is going to be an important point as well. Uh, loss of control or subjective loss of control is uh, also a big topic in human-robot collaboration. So if we're going to set up a, let's say, standardized set of gestures for human-robot communication, and that, that would work anyways, that would work with nearly any autonomous robot, just like the stop gesture, which is understandable internationally. Um, I think that would be a, a, a good thing. Um, to sum that up, um, most that I've said is uh, in the end about trust, predictability of motion is in the end about trust, uh, because I can foresee, I can predict what the robot will do, what its intentions and goals are, and what its actions will be on that. And I think two things are very much important based on this research, based on my experience. And the one is that the robot has to conform, and the other is that the robot has to inform. By conform, I mean that it has to um, conform to constraints like spatial constraints, um, environmental and user constraints, just like you know physical constraints. If uh, if the um, <clears throat> industrial robot uh, is very close to a human being, it has to sense proximity and not reach out uh, towards the uh, human being too much. Um, if the robot conforms to such constraints. This raises, this increases objective safety a lot. But that's not enough, that's not all. We also need to increase subjective well-being of human co-workers. And therefore, I think the robots also have to inform their co-workers, their human interaction partners, about the state they are in currently about the function they can do and the functions they will do, you know, what they will do as a next step. And this informing, this can be done by the kind of predictable programming of a robot motion, this can be done by light signals, by audio signals, this is a question of design. But in general, information, proactive information by robots will increase subjective safety and subjective safety will increase trust. And I think these are very important issues from a psychological viewpoint. Yeah, this was it so far, just a quick input for you, and I hope um, yeah, we can discuss these points. Thank you very much, Martina. <laughs> very, very interesting, very fascinating. Uh, I, I think, you know, my feeling is that you're doing a very important work there um, because, uh, uh, because robots are obviously all around us and are gaining ground. <laughs> you know, I just try to set up some foundations of what, what can be relevant aspects yeah. from psychology, but I think you in the audience, you're doing the real yeah. <laughs> great job. Yeah. Are there other questions from the, from the audience to Martina? There is a question. Thank you. We, we have mics, so thank you very much. Roland Hussein from Toronto. Hi. So, so Mara, do we really need the humanoid robot? <laughs> is it, are we just making a toy so guys can say we made a toy? Yeah. Um, I think maybe <coughs> in most cases the most efficient use is the four or five movements in a very fast-paced or maybe an unsafe environment. So why do we need the humanoid robot? Yeah, very good question, a question that I ask myself all the time and that is I discuss all the time with roboticists. From my background, from my experience, from the psychological know-how, I would say we don't need humanoid robots that much because um, as I wanted to you know, introduce a little bit by the uncanny valley phenomenon, I think um, even the, the approach to go in this very realistic or this very human-like direction um, is, yeah, is probably perceived as more frightening than, than, um, than good. So um, <clears throat> this 
design approach has certain risks that you don't have if you stay on a less human-like level. So from this viewpoint, from my viewpoint, I would anyway say for most use cases, I would not go in this humanoid direction. And also, I'm not sure about this argument that uh, you know we need human-like uh, bodies because the work environments are made for people. Because I think, I, if you think about uh, the possibilities of drones, for example, drones are not human-like at all, but they can fly. And I think this could be, in many cases, be, for example, much more efficient than just the, the classical uh, human possibilities, human body possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for this <coughs> question. And thank you for the clear answer. <laughs> um, you know, we, you were talking about trust a lot, and I, I like that uh, a lot, because I think this obviously seems to be one of the key points that, that must be addressed when, when it comes to robotics. And do you see from your day-to-day from your -day work, you're, you're, you're working closely with large enterprises, with very large companies. We, we have seen this one case with uh, Mercedes-Benz, and, and I've seen on your website that you're in close cooperation with many more large organizations. And uh, do you see them, these, the makers of robots? And the large enterprises which are using robotic technologies in their manufacturing facilities or wherever, do you see them really understanding that and leveraging that and, and you know, using building robots in a way that are designed to, to create trust? Um, I think that um, there's growing interest. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I can just say that I, um, you know, many, um, industry partners, companies start or have started to contact us in this regards over the last few years. So I, I really um, observe growing interest, mm -hmm. but still, you know, there's a huge potential for interdisciplinary um, collaborations. Yeah. Still, yeah. Um, we are we are talking a lot about inter and transdisciplinarity these days. These mm -hmm. are like buzzwords, but I think there's still much space. Yeah. To do this more. To do, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, other other question. Oh, here's another question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name uh, Corrado Matiuso from Cannes. So uh, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, one thing which I uh, learned here and which could uh, very useful for us uh, in standardization is this issue of trust and uh, uh, the way to have subjective safety. Yep. Because uh, when we talk about the collaborative robots, especially uh, trade unions, workers' associations, are very skeptical about this. Mm. Not only from a legal point of view, but also from this point of view, from the psychological uh, um, uh, risk, if you, if you like. Yep. Um, if, if we can uh, find there some solutions, uh, which then could be implemented also in, standard, in standardization, uh, uh, for example, uh, ways how to transmit this information effectively to somebody that he knows the robot uh, uh, is aware of him yeah. uh, and w would warn him perhaps if he's not aware of him, I don't know. <laughs> uh, such solutions would be very useful and therefore it is a good way which you have indicated. Yeah, thank think. you very much. I, I mean, that would be the best, you know, if uh, research results, um, yeah are applied to real-world scenarios. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm wondering that, you know, um, workers are different. Um, they are in large organizations and small organizations. They are in Europe or in Asia. They speak German or English or Chinese or whatever. Um, robots will be most likely everywhere the same. Um, and, and I think this, and, and also, you know, we humans are culturally Different. We understand things differently that are happening, gestures, mimic, and so on. Do we need to learn, or do need <laughs> the robots to learn, a, no, a new, I don't know, universal robotic language, so that there is a common code that we understand that a robot behaves, or we as humans behave like that, then robot will behave like that? Yeah. Um, ideally, we would not have to learn that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ideally, the robots have to learn. Yeah. And you know, um, with artificial intelligence or self learning systems, um, robots uh, will be able to adapt very nicely to the environments they are in. As you said, um, cultural differences are um, uh, very challenging. 
mm -hmm. in uh, many design aspects. As you said, or you gave the example of gestures, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so true. I, I work together a lot with Asian people, with Japanese mostly, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, I didn't get what they mean by this gesture for such a long time. Mm -hmm. It means come closer. You yeah. know, it's completely <laughs> the opposite of the yeah. meaning mm -hmm. uh, in, I mean, yeah. in Germany, in Austria, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. if, if I would do so that to you, then you would not yeah, really was, consider hey, this very you know, polite. Yeah. Every time so. they, they wanted to, to shoot a photo portrait of, of, yeah. uh, of a group, they uh, addressed me like this, and I was always like, why don't they want to have me on that photo? Yeah. <laughs> they always yeah. want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to yeah. make example, me yeah. go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, these are challenges of gesture communication. And, you know, the research is just uh, in the very beginning states. And we have to do much more experimentation, much more, much more research. Mm -hmm. We saw that it's a challenge by our um, interaction experiments with the drones already. Mm -hmm. But, as I said, with self-learning systems who mm -hmm. can sense their environments, mm -hmm. um, we're going to have robots that uh, will anyway know mm -hmm. in which environments they are and probably even know the cultural background, for example, of their users or interaction partners and mm -hmm. adapt to that. Okay. That's also a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have two minutes left for Q&A. Any more questions from the audience at that point? Hello. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Over there. <laughs> Great. Perfect. <laughs> so, thank you very much. My name is Klaus Neude. I'm more from medical and, let's say, ambient assisted living field yeah. and therefore we are also dealing with robots in general and a major point is a degree of autonomy mm -hmm. of the robot yeah. mm -hmm. and that is very very difficult to classify so we are struggling around about three years round and it's uh, I think it's the same issue in industrial area so besides uh, let's say the user interface yeah. for the standardization field it will get more info, if you can from you, more information how we can do that. Mm. Um, could we just quickly switch back to my presentation because I think I have one uh, slide that might be interesting for that, if that's, if that's easy to do. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay, because from, yeah. It is. <laughs> uh, hmm. ta, ta, I would need the next one, I think. Or the, the one before. So, yeah. No, this one. Okay, um, yeah. From a psychological viewpoint, it's also a crucial thing how, you know, the, the level of autonomy that is well accepted by people. This is what we can address from f in social sciences. And, uh, yeah, with colleagues I conducted a, a quite <coughs> interesting online experiment on that just recently, a simple experiment where we just text-wise described a robot a service robot at, at home, uh, which can ac assist people in, I think, um, uh, maybe it was like describing it can assist uh, disabled people while of, um, eating, for eating. And um, we just manipulated the degree of autonomy in this text description. And we, in one condition we described it as a tool, uh, meaning that um, the robot would all only act on command by human beings. The second condition was the autonomous robot, which means it would sense the environment and automatically um, react or set actions. And the third degree was uh, the experiencer, uh, saying that yeah, the robot would be autonomous, but also have personality and feelings. And um, again, we tested for the level of creepiness, because this uncanny valley thing is uh, <laughs> a quite relevant issue in, in human-robot interaction. And which was accepted most or which was least creepy was the tool, you know. In general, I would say people prefer, um, prefer less autonomy in the beginning stage of, of, or if they are not used to the robot, you know, um, because they fear the loss of control. We as human beings naturally want to be in control. So I would say for... Um, if, if you, yeah, before people are habituated to co-working with the robot in the beginning, uh, the robot should give many opportunities to the human being to control something, to make decisions. 
And after the human gets used to co-working with the robot, this can be done less. But in the beginning, I think, to prevent the loss of control, uh, it could be a bit more designed into this tool direction and then increase the, the level of autonomy. Maybe things like that would be good. Okay, great. Thank you very and much, uh, Martina it Mara. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It was great Thank to you. have you here on stage. Thank you for your really fascinating insights on uh, how human-robot interaction is evolving. And thank you very much um, for the questions from the audience. Um, a big hand for Martina. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you stay for, for the rest of the morning. So yeah. we will see you later again when we... Uh, have our panel and so far you know I can say that this side of the arena is the most active one so I'm looking at you guys um, I put some pressure on you you know next round I will see questions from here and there obviously so yeah um, good let's let's move on right away when we when we talked about so much about robotics and and you know the the omnipresence the growing presence of robotics in so many areas of our work and life um, then and, and, and I was I was talking in my in my introduction also about the you know enormous upspring in numbers of devices that are connected um, and so far we have mostly touched the the perspective of safety and um, yeah, but you know another very important and, and in many cases considered as the other side of the same metal is the question of security. Um, because all of these devices are connected. And um, the more connection, the more vulnerability in systems, obviously. And um, we all, uh, you know, have, maybe not personally, but, you know, over the media in, 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 and when we observe what's going on in the world, we see more and more cases of cyber security issues, cyber crime, cyber terrorism. Most of the countries, the military is dealing with this building units, building skills to deal with it. Um, it's a big discussion here in Europe, everywhere, and I, I assume it's, it's a global issue. And for that reason, um, we have decided to invite a speaker here to our stage um, who is a real expert in cybersecurity and can give us an update, um, take us on a journey, so to say, um, what's going on in cybersecurity. And, um, you know, I, I imagine and, 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 and I want to warn you, so to say, it could be a little bit frightening um, because maybe we will see some things that will really, you know, not make us very calm. Um, with respect to what's going on there, but even more, it's important to talk about that and to understand what's going on and to do the right things in organizations, in countries, in, in our day-to-day -day life and behavior. So I'm very happy to have uh, Sandro Geiken here. Sandro, please come on stage, join me here. Ladies and gentlemen, blackout. This was only... Uh, security. This was, thank you, this was only a second, you know, <laughs> a second to, you know, envision and to experience a blackout. This was, you know, just, it was a soft experience, I would say, <laughs> because we know it's only an exercise um, and, um, and everything was back on track after a second. But imagine what's going on in your life, in our life, in our organizations, if the lights go down for hours if um, the energy supply uh, goes out for days, um, and if all the critical, so-called critical infrastructures um, are away for a moment or for a longer period. And I think, Sandro, this is one of the key topics that you will talk about. I, I read a quote um, from, from you in 2013. You uh, asked us all to throw away our computers um, because they are at the heart of all the uncertainty and the lack of security. And, and I'm very curious to find out what the update on that is. Should we still throw it away or do you see any improvement in this respect? Well, the idea was to throw them away and get new ones, and I yeah, still stick okay. to that idea. <laughs> this is also a ve <laughs> very industry-friendly message, yeah. so to say. <laughs> um, but I think your message overall will not be so much industry-friendly, but very critical, and, and we are very curious to find out more about what's going on in cybersecurity. Okay, Sandro, your thank stage. you very much for Give the introduction. 20 or 23 minutes even, okay, good. Oh, 20, that's good. 
Okay, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a director of a newly founded institute in Berlin, just been founded in February by some of the DAX companies, uh, non-IT DAX companies, I have to say, because some of the big technology companies, uh, banking and finance, are sick and tired with the empty promises of the IT industry and want some uh, critical research being done on that and critical technical development, so they put me in charge. And you can see how desperate they are in security that they put a tattooed guy in sneakers in charge of their strategic development and digitization. Uh, apart from that, I work in uh, military counterintelligence for the past five, six years, so I'm uh, working on the high end of uh, cybersecurity problems. I work for NATO every now and then, develop country strategies and stuff like that, and this is the world uh, from which I come and from which I will tell you something about uh, the connections between safety and security. Um, we have a lot of examples, of course. The Internet of Things is full of new stories of... Um, uh, connections of things, uh, formerly old technology, dumb technology, stupid technology, now gets sensors, gets options, is getting smart, gets chips, is uh, getting hardware, software, everything, and then everything is connected to each other. So that's a complete security nightmare uh, for any security researcher. Of course, we are uh, always happy when bad things happen. We, we profit, uh, profit a lot from bad security, so we're never really unhappy. Uh, but it is a nightmare because um, uh, so far as it stands, and as you will realize, so Certainly, uh, we haven't solved the cybersecurity problem. So obviously, there are a lot of quest uh, questions up in the air. There's a lot of conferences. There's always incidents every other week, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, most 90% of the incidents you don't even see or get an idea of because they happen deep inside the systems. Mostly, the victims even don't know that they're being attacked, and they think it's just a failure or something happening. But there's a lot going on, so we haven't even solved this problem in the old IT world, and now we're beginning to construct a new IT world with even more uh, safety scenarios, security scenarios, terrible risks coming up. If I attach everything, old technology, planes, airports, um, uh, cars, infrastructures to IT now, which is completely vulnerable, that sounds like a very bad idea. And uh, I've just given you, brought you some some of the examples we're having in risks uh, in the more safety-related areas of embedded IT and production and infrastructure. So, um, first of all, an interesting question is uh, why doesn't, why is it interesting to hack these things? So, why does anybody want to hack them? In fact, we don't see that many hacks on production and infrastructure yet. Uh, and the reason is that some of the business models are not really fully developed in the militaries and the intelligence community and un among criminals. Um, but at the same time, we see a lot of uh, a surge in activity and an in interest in hacking these things. In, in, uh, in, the, in the hacking community, we call this junk hacking uh, because we're hacking junk. And uh, but just as a little anecdote on that, in the hacking community right now, if you hand in a paper on junk hacking in a hacking conference, it's very unlikely to be accepted because it's far too easy to hack junk. So there's no art in that, so you're not ex accepted to a real hacking conference just because you can hack a power plant. Everybody can hack a power plant. So why would you hack a power plant? Why would you hack production uh, sites? Um, there are some scenarios like signaling and deterrence from military. Uh, we've just seen that in the incident with Black Energy that was an attack on a Ukrainian power plant uh, in the Ukrainian conflict. Um, the Russians like to, the, the Russians are good Clausewitzians from a military point of view, so they like to tell stories, political stories, with the military activities they unfold. And in this case, they wanted to tell that one story they, they love in particular is that NATO is not possible, is not able to protect other countries and that Russia is very powerful. So uh, they use this. Um, incident or created this incident where they switched off the power in western Ukraine for a couple of hours by attacking this power plant with a hacking attack uh, to demonstrate their might and to demonstrate how useless NATO is. Fortunately, that particular power plant still had the old analog wiring going, so they were able to just switch off the IT and switch back on the old analog wiring uh, because they hadn't kicked it out yet. They had just re recently been modernized. Um, so um, they were able to do it, but if they wouldn't have been, they, that would have been an outage for as long as the Russians would uh, have liked. Um, we're also seeing um, a few incidents of competitive sabotage coming, on, uh, coming up where competitors are, are hacking uh, the, their competitors' technologies to make them look bad in demonstrations, to make them look bad in export markets. Uh, there's a few first things coming up here from uh, uh, particular sectors of technology. Um, we're seeing an interest by organized criminals to do trade manipulation by hacking production sites. If I can hack into a car manufacturing or even an aerospace manufacturing and I can 
cause the system to break down uh, for a couple of hours and cause gigantic damages and cause a loss in, in time and timeliness of the production and everything, um, the damage can be quite substantial and the trade course can go down quite rapidly. We actually had an instance of like that uh, last year in Germany where a steel mill was hacked and you could see which, uh, which, which was the victim by the trade course uh, that has gone down. And um, I've, we, we have a, a few instances as well where you can hack companies so badly uh, that they lose uh, so much money that they would consider that an extinction event. So one great example, which I always love to tell, is SAP. SAP, by the way, is considered the most insecure software in the world. Uh, SAP always asked me to say that Oracle isn't any better, uh, but Oracle actually is a little bit better at least. Uh, somehow, however, if you hack the SAP uh, installation of a Fortune 500 or a DAX 30 company and you cause a, a massive SAP outage or you're even ca capable of wiping all the data, rewriting it with encrypted stuff so nobody can use it anymore, um, then this can cause damages of uh, a few billion uh, dollars or euros very quickly. So we had one incident in a Fortune 500 company where the SAP broke down, a reported incident, and the damages were 22 million US dollars per minute, per minute. So you can consider if you can afford that for, and for how long you can afford that. So this is one area of trade manipulation. Of course, we have military sabotage as well, and we have blackmailing attempts from the crime industry. And just to give you some examples, um, of what that could cost. So we have uh, a blackout scenarios is something that we have considered. They, they cost 600 million euros uh, per hour. And then we have other rather nasty, ha uh, nasty uh, hazards and risks in uh, other areas developing. One example is nuclear. For a long time, we, we thought that nuclear was not attackable because the nuclear community used to tell us all sort of crap, how secure everything is and how super everything is and the zoning concept they have and this works and this works and that's good. Uh, but it all turned out to be lies and mirrors. Most, most of the cases they wouldn't have known themselves. We, we reckon so they were honest, uh, but just not informed. Um, but we actually found a, a, a lot of ways to hack into nuclear power plants, civil nuclear power plants. Uh, this is an incident that is uh, sort of illustrating the, the problem. So when you get in there with a laptop and you're doing some work in the inner circle then, and you have some malware on the laptop, then it can easily jump onto the inner circle of the uh, nuclear power plant. And uh, even worse, some of the militaries unfortunately develop an interest to hack nuclear weapons. So that's a new trend among militaries. And uh, I come from offense, so I know that if, if you're doing hacking, shit can happen as well, just as well as in defense. Uh, so and if you hack an environment uh, where you don't really know how it works, then anything can happen. So now uh, we're having this nice new trend of uh, people who probably don't know, know how to hack very properly are trying to hack into nuclear intercontinental missiles. So that could be great fun in the future. Um, unfortunately, also in the area of industrial IT um, and production IT, critical infrastructure IT, um, this is a part, an area of programming where programmers never really took care of security. So then they never took care of software quality, they have very high levels in, in software assurance. Uh, so they were basically just bolting things on top of each other, writing all sorts of spaghetti code with lots of defects in there. We find very high defect rates, unfortunately, in industrial software. So we have to consider this very, very vulnerable. And unfortunately, we find a lot of software coding errors, which were thought extinct in the community, still uh, present in much of industrial IT. So it's very vulnerable. We have very bad scenarios. Um, we also have a problem with uh, downward compatibility. The, this is an, a screenshot from the, uh, the, the uh, uh, black energy attack on the Ukrainian power plant. And the problem was that they were modernized, in exclamation marks, with Windows NT systems. So the, the digital environment is not like top-notch, uh, uh, first-class IT system up to date, but because the industrial IT community is used still to program in Windows 95, Windows NT, some even still in DOS, so with machines which are very heavily insecure and impossible to secure right now, uh, all of these IT environments are instantly vulnerable to attacks and impossible to protect right now. Um, we're also seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh, interest in these things uh, developing. Um, so we are having, uh, this is the back and forth between Iran and the US. Uh, you may remember that the US attacked the, the Iranian attempt to create nuclear weapons and with the Stuxnet attack. Iran was angry about that and got back at them. And over the years, over just four years actually, Iran got very, very good at hacking. So apparently they had some friends who were helping them developing offensive capabilities. And just within four years they were capable to come up with um, 
operations like this. This was in 2014, the Operation Cleaver. And the Operation Cleaver was already very sophisticated in an espionage campaign. And the interesting thing about Cleaver was that they didn't, when we first saw Cleaver, we thought that this was a standard industrial espionage thing, maybe coming from China or something. But then we found out, first it came from Iran, and secondly, it didn't look for blueprints. So it didn't look for the usual stuff, industrial spies look for, look for industrial configurations, blueprints, decision hierarchies, and stuff like that. These guys were looking for control and access data, and they were looking for control and access data of critical infrastructures, power plants, airlines in particular, airports, and uh, energy and utilities. So they were clearly looking for, apart from some strategic espionage they did, uh, they were looking to prepare sabotage attacks. And that, of course, makes a lot of sense. Uh, for any sort of military actor to be capable to do this and to sabotage other economies and other states. Um, another area which has us worrying right now is the whole area field of embedded IT, where of course also a lot of safety regulation applies or should apply. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's always IT in there as well somewhere, and I can attack the IT. And, and what a few cases which worry us uh, a, a bit more, first of all, is medical IT. Uh, I heard you come from medical IT, so that's a, a big problem. Medical IT actually has, still has a lot of downward compatibility problems as well, so a lot of Windows 95, Windows NT, whatever you name it. Um, they don't really have good security concepts so far, but they're still pressed to plug everything into each other and onto the internet. Um, and unfortunately, we have a lot of demonstrations that you can rather easily hack into these things. So this is an old story uh, where it was demonstrated that you can, you can do targeted killings by hacking pacemakers. So apparently pacemakers have crazy configurational options. You can do a few hundred configurations for pacemakers, although most people only need 10. And I can find individual pacemakers of individual patients by first hacking the pacemaker company and then hacking the doctor of the target uh, in the area where the target lives and finding out which number maps to which patient. And then I can send a configuration through the company to that individual, individual patient and kill him. So that's something that was demonstrated to be capable. And uh, Dick Cheney, after uh, learning that from NSA, had his uh, pacemaker uh, put out and exchanged by an old analog one from the flea market. Um, another thing uh, we can also do is, I mean, the whole field of medical IT is just vast. You can, you can basically hack into all that stuff, do all sorts of fun things. We just have a few examples. Uh, well, this is another one uh, which is rather recent. We can, we can hack the hospital drug pumps as well and change the configurations in there, change the, change the recipes. And this is a very recent story, uh, which will be interesting for you. Uh, namely, we had one uh, a, share, a group of shareholders which were assessing the cybersecurity of their medical IT products. And they found out that the cybersecurity of the medical IT products was so awful that they didn't expect the company to survive. And overnight, they, they uh, sold all the stock they had in this company. So that was considered in the security community a very important signal uh, that shareholders are not tolerating insecure products anymore because the market will not tolerate insecure products anymore. So if I produce insecure medical IT equipment, um, I better take care of cybersecurity right from the bottom. <coughs> Yeah, another area also is airline safety and, and airplane safety. Actually, hacking a plane is, is uh, pretty much a bitch. Uh, you don't want to do that. It's a lot of work. And the, the aerospace industry, especially Airbus and Boeing, the two uh, big ones, took a lot of care to do proper security engineering for, uh, for much longer than most of the rest of the industry. And it's still possible, but it's very, very difficult. You have to have a lot of access. So it's possible for intelligence services or highly skilled and highly resourced organized criminals who usually don't have an interest in hacking these things, so it's comparatively safe. Um, but we're still worried about some scenarios. So we still have a lot of scenarios, uh, both technically as well as tactically and strategically, where it could be interesting to hack into airplanes. And uh, one very bad thing that always has to be considered when you hack things, uh, you, you, don't just, you don't have to hack just one thing. You usually hack one technology, and when that technology happens to be in 100 different planes at once, I can kill 100 different planes at once. So I don't really have to just have to be in one if I don't want to. It's rather in, in, in hacking, I rather have to put a lot of effort in just hitting one single technology rather than hitting the whole plane of technologies. Um, 
There's also the option that a lot of dual-use technology is uh, from, from militaries is used in these things so that some attacks on uh, fighter jets actually migrate to the civil aerospace area because they use the same components and a military attacker attacks a component in a fighter jet which is then used in a civil jet and then that somehow migrates or some, we have all sorts of stuff uh, uh, that happened in this case already. So this is also a possible scenario. So now why does this concern safety? Of course, this, these are all security things, so why should you worry about safety? Obviously, uh, because in smart environments, safety and security are becoming ever more entangled. You had this nice picture of the collaborative robot, robot working there. This is, of course, one scenario uh, where I could hack into the robot and make him strangle the worker to death. Uh, this, uh, if the security wiring is, or the safety wiring is not completely separate from the IT wiring, which in most cases is sort of an open question. So I know some robot designer like AB did a proper job in keeping the wiring separate and not putting them on the same bus and stuff like that. Uh, but many others will not because many others all have this strange idea that they in can increase safety by networked IT working on safety things. Um, so, in, However, in many environments, uh, we simply don't know how entangled safety and security are. Um, uh, but we assume, uh, from, and we know actually from some uh, dives we did, um, that there are a lot of entanglements. A problem is also that the complexity in this field is absolutely overwhelming. So if I just look at the complexity of the IT environment, this is a usual uh, Internet of Things and, uh, uh, environment uh, complexity graph of uh, just a few, very few devices and what they connect to, whom they connect with, and what the connectors connect with, and then connect, 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 and so on and so forth. So it's a very huge, as soon as you connect something, you have a very huge environment. And um, you can, also, of course, attack a, a core system which is considered secure by attacking the periphery. So that's something that's very easily being done. And then uh, the periphery is usually a lot less secure than the core. Uh, and uh, this is a, an example of a smart meter that has been hacked. A hacker had turned the, uh, the, the, the uh, temperature in the room up to 40 degrees Celsius. And if you want to reduce again, you have to pay like 500 euros. Um, or you can also hack smart bulbs and get them to explode. Uh, this has also been demonstrated to be practical and, and possible. And um, a, a very common way for hackers actually to operate is to hack uh, the supply chain. So if I would want to attack a company like Airbus, I wouldn't attack Airbus because that would be a lot of effort uh, for, to get into some of the core secrets. Uh, but Airbus has some 22,000 suppliers and the non likely 90% of those don't even have cybersecurity because they cannot afford it. It's small, medium enterprises. They don't know how to do this properly. So I can hack into that and then simply deliver, have them deliver my hack into Airbus. Um, this has been demonstrated in cars, so I think car safety is an interesting thing for standardization as well. Uh, we've had a lot of scenarios in the community uh, where you can hack cars and do all sorts of things, influence the brake-by-wire system, influence the accelerator, influence the steering wheel, and <clears throat> there's a lot of possible hops also into the cars. Uh, I also know some German man car manufacturers who are still very, very bad at security. I'm not going to name names, but they're in the list there somewhere. Um, and the hackers usually publish a list of the 10 most hackable cars, and, uh, which are very easy to access. And right now, it's really so easy to hack a car, a smart car, uh, that you don't get hacks of smart cars acknowledged anymore on conferences, because it's just too simple and a, a no-brainer, so to speak, among the IT guys to hack a car. Um, we also have the problem that attacks can migrate easily from security to safety scenarios. So we're having a lot of uh, uh, proliferation problems, for instance, in IT security, where hacks are being developed, and then, uh, like the NSA hacks, and then somebody leaks these hacks, and then uh, the minute after these hacks are leaked, the black market uh, starts, to, starts to engage and is trying to get the code. And usually, I'm, I still remember when we, when we first heard about Stuxnet, like three days after we first heard about Stuxnet in the news, everybody had the source code of Stuxnet. Nobody really knew where this came from, but like from all directions, uh, this attack migrated through the fora, through the communities, uh, engineers looking for help, exchanging the code, then oops, oh, I lost this to this Russian cybercrime forum, sorry guys. Um, and so there's a lot of proliferation going on of these attacks. 
and then they're being recycled, remodulated, and put into different uh, contexts. You can simply buy them on the black market. And uh, the, the uh, interesting example of how quick that is was, <clears throat> again, the black energy incident in the Ukraine, where they used black energy to attack a power plant. And then just a, a, a few days after that, the same attack was used uh, allegedly by criminals to attack railways and mining companies in Ukraine, who had the same IT outset. So they simply took that attack, found it on the black market, recycled it, and shot it into a different direction. Um, we're also having uh, problems sometimes with containment. Stuxnet only was so popular because they didn't get the containment properly, and you can see that even if the NSA doesn't get the containment properly, this can happen. Um, so that's why we uh, learned about Stuxnet in the first place, because it kept, kept appearing on many, many different Siemens installations all the time, uh, because it, it went out into the wild through the internet, and then all of a sudden was here in a power plant, there in a production site, uh, because they all used the same kind of tech. And we had other stories like that with Config, uh, a rather old story, but uh, a seemingly simple worm, but which kept reappearing, reappearing, very difficult to fight, and we still have some, uh, some attacks uh, and some of our companies, which are very hard to remove permanently. We, we really have this problem that we have some attacks where the most skilled experts are not capable to remove them permanently uh, from uh, some core system. So um, the problem here is also that we have many new attackers. Uh, we have 120 states trying to come up with cyber capabilities, a lot of criminals who are trying to do this. Um, uh, many of them are not very sophisticated, so they will not be good in containment. Uh, that many of them just follow simple new tactics where they simply don't care about containment or stratagems and businesses, so this will uh, clearly be a problem as well. And this is especially dangerous for uh, highly homogeneous systems in highly monolithic markets. So one example is the petrochemical stuff where there's only a few IT technologies, so if I have one attack on these IT technologies and that's a good target, the, the petrochemical industries, it is very likely to migrate across a plane of different other petrochemical sites and uh, the same also applies to the pacemaker problem. There are only six producers of pacemakers, or I've heard, or seven, something like that. Uh, and they, they all use a very similar tech environment. So this is also something I can attack. Um, another problem is also that attackers may even start to target safety. So we've seen that uh, the offense is becoming more interested in this. Uh, the offense evolution also has just started, and we have a lot of unconventional actors who are coming to this game who are try now trying to get some, get some money, and we've seen some first attacks. So, I, I mean, we see funny attacks uh, migrating into context where nobody would have thought that anybody would hack this uh, in the first place all the time. But a new trend from 2015 is to hack ships. So they're hacking ships, container ships, they're hacking the certificates with the, with the freight on the ships so they can sell the oil load in the, in the harbor three, four times before the ship arrives. And uh, they're also hacking the GPS, the pirates are hacking the GPS satellites and the GPS navigation system of the tankers to, to pull them away from a protected route into unprotected waters so they can hijack them. So these are new, new applications of hacking from the crime guys. They're very creative, very innovative, as you can see. And unfortunately, we also see them approach safety critical environments. So the ransomware communities trying to blackmail people with, by encrypting their accounts and then you have to send money so they decrypt it again and you get access to your computer. They're attacking safety critical environments now because they think that safety critical environments are likely to pay fast and not call the police. And they've just been trying to, uh, they're, they're experimenting right now with hospitals, uh, sending a ransomware attacks to hospitals. They're experiment, experimenting with critical infrastructures right now, trying to find the price range when they pay quickly. And uh, this is cer certainly something that will um, continue to uh, concern us. And we're also having cyber attacks on uh, peripheral systems with safety implications like air traffic control systems. Air traffic control systems are absolutely not secure in comparison to airplanes, uh, but they still, of course, have a huge systemic effect on the safety of airplanes. Uh, so this is also something that uh, creates a huge safety risk and something that is of interest to military attackers. We just had this incident in Sweden in 2016 where allegedly the Russians switched off the, the air traffic ground control system of Sweden for a few hours just to demonstrate that they could. Okay, so shit can happen. This is the message I wanted to uh, convey to you. I hope that uh, I was successful. So now what are you supposed to do? Uh, you have to come up to speed. You are very important in this field. You have to understand the implications and interrelations between safety and security. And I wish, I really wish that you would imply this very proper 
very good safety regulation stuff on security because security regulation is awful. The market is terrible and everything we have in security doesn't work. So if somebody from your professional expertise with this rigor you have in safety comes to security and then overrules this terrible security environment, that will really be of help. Uh, the first problem you will notice when you're doing this is that tons of IT lobbyists will come to you and talk, try to talk you into how secure everything is and how super everything is and that they can solve the problem and you don't have to worry and here's a car and there's the money. So um, this is something that we've seen a lot in security regulations. So whenever, and the problem is that the policymakers don't understand tech, so they're happy when somebody from Microsoft or SAP comes to them and explains tech to them uh, so they can seemingly do something. Uh, but most of the times they're just interested in lying to you or cheating you into some, some other way so they can continue to sell their terrible products. So try hard to get real independent expertise. That's a very big challenge in this field. And uh, one uh, little advice I can give you, there is something like an unhackable computer. We call that high assurance computing in IT. Uh, so the unhackable computer exists. And I think from a safety point of view, it's very interesting to compare that to the stuff we have right now and then probably see uh, which kind of characteristics you want to regulate into this field. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandro. Poo, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to say. <laughs> Poo. Um, is, there, is there anything, any place left which is safe? Uh, but anything that doesn't have a computer inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, but, you know, it's... it's uh, it's a storm of, of, uh, of examples um, that, you know, really uh, let, let me and, and I think most in the audience, you know, are not feeling safer now um, after knowing all of that. And, and you know, some, some things uh, really, you know, thrilled me then when you said that maybe when I understood you right, the, the more dangerous are even the uh, lower sophisticated or less sophisticated hackers mm. because they do not care for containment and, and this means that proliferation of these tactics and, and, and code and so is malware and stuff is, is, even, is even bigger and goes even faster yep. and so it's, uh, um, it's really impressive. Um, questions from the audience? Over here, thank you. Well, we have, we have microphones, yeah. Um, how to become a hacker? Is there a bachelor study or something, or a <laughs> basic course or so? That's too late for you, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, <laughs> I see. The, the problem you have to be six years old and have a computer instead of parents. So that's the recipe. If you really want to be what we call a wizard, so a wizard is a hacker who understands technology intuitively, then you have to start very early. Uh, you can try to become a security engineer afterwards by learning that in the university, but you would have to have very good teachers, and you wouldn't really get up to the speed of a wizard. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Other questions? Over here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Katerina Bostoli from Technological Educational Institution in Greece. So in standardization, we used to say that uh, preventive actions are better than corrective actions. Um, recent international studies revealed the fact that the profile of the most, let's say, dangerous uh, hackers or attackers are white IT young people of ages 23 to 28. Do you think that the psychology and education, education and standardization could be helpful in this uh, direction? Um, it is only the money or something else that motivate these IT young people to be attackers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, the, 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 I think you're referring to the type of hacker who's like the teenage kid trying to hack fun stuff for, I don't know what, political purposes or, or fun. Um, but this category is almost extinct because everybody who can hack will have a job, a very well-paid job, either in the industry or in the intelligence services very quickly. Um, so right now, we, we don't really have this uh, uh, spare time fun hacker anymore in the wild. Only a very few instances, and um, the few we have are not very powerful. So most of the good hackers right now actually are employed somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of the Fortune 500 companies hiring these 
hairy, uh, smelly 18-year-olds and, and giving them lots of freedom and a huge salary and stuff like that. We had a funny instance, actually, of uh, um, the Pentagon hiring a friend of mine, much, uh, who's really one of these hairy, smelly hackers. He doesn't come to work when he has to. He comes to work and he wants to. And he leaves work when he wants to. He doesn't leave work when he has to. So he was introduced into the Pentagon as one of the research directors for cyber defense because he was so very good. And uh, the generals hated him. Everybody hated him. The whole bureaucracy hated him because he didn't play by the rules. He didn't wear the proper things. He always left stuff somewhere where he shouldn't left that. Um, but these are the things that are happening now. So they, they have to be flexible if they really want to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if unhackable com computers exist, where's the problem? Are the others too stupid? and? Why it's not possible to have more unhack unhackable computers? They're not industrialized, so the the it's a, a legacy problem uh, that we're having. So the, we we have these unhackable computers in some uh, use cases at DARPA, for instance. The Boeing unmanned little bird is a, a helicopter drone which is run on SEL4. That's a formally verified microkernel, an operating system without any vulnerabilities, so it's impossible to hack. NSA has tried to hack the unmanned little bird and didn't succeed. They were not capable of doing it. And they're using the same operating system now in trucks, in army trucks, to, to get them autonomously driving through the desert without uh, um, any, any pilots and without uh, being capable to be hacked. Um, but um, if I want to, I've frequently tried to introduce these high assurance system into the German industry or into some parts of the IT industry. And the problem was always that they have such a big amount of Microsoft sitting around there, all Linux systems, and migrating all, the, all that to new IT, also telling your system engineers that they have to learn to program SEL4 now, so all the stuff they learned before is useless, uh, that's a big problem. So the challenge is really to, to industrialize this sort of market, which of course is a great opportunity as well, so if you're a business guy sitting here somewhere, uh, that could be a great opportunity. The unhackable computer exists. Uh, the technology is there, it's mature, you just have to find a way to industrialize it into a market which consists of bad, cheap IT. Okay, but is this not a prerequisite for Industry 4.0? Uh, if not, uh, you ha we are going towards the c catastrophe, or not? Well, from my experience I had, I had a lot of, a lot of experience with Industry 4.0 guys, you tell them that you have this highly secure solution, and then they tell you, yeah, uh, okay, but we already did this. And now it's too late, and we have to roll this out in the market because the Chinese are so fast and the US are so fast, and if I'm not with my solution on the market next week, I'm dead. So it's too late, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions? To what extent, Sandro, are you optimistic that we will you know, be able to manage this turnaround? Not, it, not, not very much, obviously. <laughs> no, but, uh, we have it, some. It sounds like yeah. it would take a real reinvention of the computing industry. Yeah, no, we have some some takers now who are investing in this in high assurance technologies, obviously from the defense area, from aerospace. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how how fast they will be with creating actual implementations and applications mm -hmm. of these technologies. Of course, they start small in their own little areas and niches, mm -hmm. and uh, then it, it it will depend on how far evolved the industry 4.0 market for instance, is and how possible it is to break up the path dependencies, to change the legacy systems. Mm -hmm. uh, will also depend on whether you're capable to develop migration ideas or the adaptation yeah. ideas for these mm -hmm. high assurance systems. Yeah, right yeah. In, in, you know, in, in looking back in history, I think there are many cases in which military uh, was, you know, the instance that, that drove real change yeah. and drove real innovation. And, you know, if I listen to you and, and, and what you're saying at the end now, that you see these unhackable computers uh, used only, as far as I understood, in military environments so far, yeah. um, then maybe again we need to trust the military to do this. It not not very positive yeah. <laughs> perspective, obviously. But um, yeah, okay. Good, Sandra. Thank you very much okay. for your presentation Welcome. and for answering the questions. Thank all of you for the questions. And it was really impressive. Give them a big hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, um, so I think um, we are now, we're pretty much in time, which is great, and we will now come to our third uh, keynote, and this will not be a keynote, it will be an interview, but before we start uh, with the interview with uh, Kirsten Brun, I would like to uh, show you a video that gives us a little bit more insight on what she's doing in the water. <laughs>
Away nicely, Kirsten Bruin in lane number four, but also away very well with Weber Trebert in lane number two. But look at the early pace of Kirsten Bruin making this her own already at 25 metres, a full body length clear. Head down for just two strokes, keeping the chin low, profile low to the water surface, once again to support the lower body. You can see the rhythm and almost feel the timing of Kirsten Brun here in lane four. She now stretches the lead to three body lengths. We're going to be inside world record pace of the 50 metre turn. In fact, it's a new world record of 50 metres, would you believe? 43-48. Absolutely flying. <laughs> Second place is Weber Tribur. Third is near Kistler for the USA, but it's all about Kirsten Brun. The 42-year-old German storming home here. The gold medal is hers all the way. It's a great battle for bronze at the moment and silver. But some 15 metres clear, Kirsten Brun comes home for Germany, comes home for a gold medal. Comes home for a record, quite possibly, could well be a new Paralympic record. Just outside. <laughs> 135.50, slightly slower than this morning. What a great swim. The silver medal here going to lane number five, Song, great. for the People's Republic of China came through. Ner Kistler for the USA takes bronze. Weber Falling back to fourth place for Austria. I think, you know, this this looks like a massive lead. <laughs> Please join me on stage, Kirsten Brun. <coughs> so I will, I will get us two of these boxes for our interview. Second. So, should we go over here? Is this okay? Sure. Perfect. You're welcome. It's it's great to have you here. You are a as, as I said in the in the intro. You are a three-time uh, gold medalist in the Paralympics. Um, this was, was this in Athens or in, Ro uh, in, in, in London. London? London, okay. So this was your last, yep. last uh, Paralympic appearance. So, and it, does it still make you shiver when you see that? Or have you seen it so many times that you're used no, to no, it? No, no, it's still impressed. And I'm sweating like I'm in the water. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, you know, this, this achievement and this, I think, was, was a bigger thing than what we have to do here. So it will be, it will be very comfortable. And it's great to have, you, to have you here. You know, when, when, I, was, when I was introducing uh, you and, and opening the session, then um, I, I think I mentioned that uh, one of the last statistics, I've seen that uh, approximately 10% of the world population are people, um, um, are disabled uh, people. 10%, so it's a massively large portion of the overall population of our planet. And it, I think it's extremely important uh, to talk about uh, your specific view on, um, on uh, safety and standardization in this particular respect. And this is what we want to do. But before we jump uh, into this, I would obviously uh, like you uh, to tell us a little bit about Rio. Uh, Rio was uh, the place where the last uh, Paralympic Games uh, were happening, um, and, and I think, uh, I, I know you were there, uh, so what kind of experience was it for you to be there again? I hope you know also that I didn't was there for an athlete. Yeah, I, sure. Yeah, okay, so yeah. <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I saw a lot, experienced uh, in Rio, beautiful things, shocking things, and things that have made me really think. The joy, the life-affirming attitude of the Brazils was very striking and also quite catching. And then again, the ignorance and the naivety of the people shocked me a lot. They know that their country is deep trouble and having financial problems, but apparently they do not do much against it. For example, when you look at the problems of waste, crime and the social divide, it is quite repressing to see that. 
so mixed emotions, obviously, um, uh, from from Rio. I think um, all of us, even the ones which have not been there, but seeing the media coverage, are sharing this because it was obvious. Um, although many said that with the Paralympics, um, the mood and the whole organization and so worked much better than with the Olympics eventually, but uh, there was a lot of mixed feelings, obviously, yeah. around that, yeah. You are one of the most successful Paralympic athletes. Um, you, as I said, uh, you reigned the water for 12 years, and, and in your, uh, with your sport and your profession in sport, uh, you, you've traveled the whole world. You have seen not only the three places where the Paralympic Games happened, I assume you have been in every continent and in so many countries and cities. And, and I want to know what is your experience from that. It would be interesting for us to hear in particular uh, where or on which occasions your experiences were particularly positive or particularly negative with regard to accessibility and inclusion. USA, Canada, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, also UK, um, accessibility has come a long way. Mm -hmm. It's well thought out and simply a matter of course. I wish it was the same everywhere. Okay. It starts with public toilets and ends with the shelves in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. Everyone can get them and if not, there are persons who will help you to pack your shopping and also to help you with your shopping. I have never seen that in Germany. <laughs> in Scandinavia, everyone will come to you and ask you what you would like or what are you looking for? <laughs> Not why are you sitting in a wheelchair or why are you a person with a disability? Taking things naturally is not a German strength, unfortunately, and that's really pity. Okay, I, I completely agree. You know, Germany is such a rich country. It should be uh, able easily to, to uh, reach the same level of inclusion here, like in the other markets and, and countries you mentioned. Um, but um, it's, it's nice to hear that, that there are countries, USA, Canada, Scandinavia, uh, you mentioned that, where you have um, gathered particularly positive um, experiences, but you know, obviously, we also want to know um, the other side um, of the medal. Um, um, can you tell us about particularly negative experiences as well? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to coffee, uh, a coffee, cafe, to restaurant that calls itself accessible, and the accessible toilet is in the basement, and the basement is accessible only by stairs. That's unacceptable, I think. There is no excuse for that. No cannot simply claim that you didn't know or that is what planned differently. Mm. We should then simply delete the accessible take in the network to avoid nasty surprises. Mm -hmm. Another example is diet and nutrition plans which you receive online. Mm -hmm. And you have regist reg reg registered <laughs> your personal data and also you are in a wheelchair and have difficulty walking, you receive tips such as you should walk more steps all day. Mm -hmm. You haven't received the target. What a wonder. Or that you should try jogging, but not too fast. <laughs> when you reply that you are in a wheelchair and walking or jogging may be a bit difficult, the new tip you receive is that you could try power walking instead. <laughs> Sorry, but you understand that is really painful and frustrating. Mm -hmm. These systems and programs are so generalized and so little customized that I can only advise against them. Okay. Yeah, obviously, and it's, it's, it's really a pity what you describe because we are talking here on that stage today about artificial intelligence and, and highly capable computing power and then your, your experience is that poor in reality. So that I think is, is important to understand and to know that the gap between theory, what is possible and what is the reality is still big. Not in every respect, but in too many respects, obviously. Um, we know you, Kristen, as a top athlete and have seen seen you on the podium at Paralympic Games um, and I think these are moments which make you shiver still and, and make us shiver when we see this and we see this enormous um, achievement and 
and this is very fascinating, but I think behind all of that is uh, a lot of hard work and training. Um, you'll not, I, I, you know, I, I can easily imagine that you will not fly through the water like that without hard training every day for years. Um, and um, so I want, to, I want to touch this perspective also a little bit in our conversation. However, to get to this point of, you know, uh, professionalism and uh, success in your sport um, implies a huge amount of work, training, and of course also managing your everyday life as a person with disability. Let's talk about these everyday experiences a little bit. And I would like to know where technology in particular has already entered your life, I think as all our lives, or is maybe even determining your life. Yeah, laptop, smartphone, tablets, lifts, elevators, telephone banking, car equipment, um, for example, keyless go. Mm -hmm. I will never miss it again. <laughs> or an automatic boot light, mm -hmm. the internet, and especially for my boyfriend, online shopping, yeah. <laughs> because he hates shopping even more than I do. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, you know, things like um, Keyless Go, for example, you know, which is simply another aspect of more comfortability uh, for a person without disability is maybe for you even more important. Yeah? And, uh, and we also learn that uh, cars are uh, technology systems which are very easy to hack, so a very difficult area, obviously, and dangerous field. Um, these technological devices or services that you as a person with a disability um, uses, uh, to what extent are they custom-made for you very individually or specifically designed for you and for your special um, disability? Um, or do you know technologies and use technologies where inclusion is already built into the system, is built into the device? The car is customized with hand throttle and hand brake, mm -hmm. so I can do everything with my right hand. Mm -hmm. Blind people are usually neglected in laptop or smartphone design. Mm -hmm. That's also pity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With sanitary faci facilities, there is often a will to do things right, mm -hmm. perfect, but the implementation doesn't work. Automatic doors are often out of order mm -hmm. and often too often, for my opinion, they cannot be locked. Mm -hmm. High adjustable toilets often don't work, which makes using them a little bad adventure. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. So still, um, most of the technologies that you're using um, with particular respect to your disability are uh, custom-made and, and, and our specialties um, and I think uh, the the message is that uh, that is about uh, should be about to be changed and should become more a standardized thing which is not something that we need to build or one need to build specifically. Um, how do you see the role of new technologies? We have talked about many of the new technologies arising now, robotics and um, uh, and all these, you know, very um, intelligent interconnected systems with artificial intelligence and so on. How do you see the role of these new technologies, maybe for example with specific respect to robotics, in order to bring big issues such as accessibility and inclusion a big step forward? As long as these technologies work and are reliable, this is a fantastic development. And for Nuchetoli, I have seen a lot of cases where the reliability and the cost benefit ratio mm -hmm. were rather poor or simply too expensive. Okay. As I said, around 10% of the population live with some kind of disability. Do you think that technology dealers and developers are aware of the enormous dimension of this target group? And are the specific needs of technology uses with disabilities sufficiently taken into account from your opinion, from your experience? Not at all. In my view, you have to add older people, children, to these 10%. Mm -hmm. Barriers often have to do with high weight or language. Mm -hmm. 
things that many older people and children also cannot deal with or understand. Mm -hmm. We also must not ignore the demographic chance, mm -hmm. change. Humanity is growing older and medicine more perfect, which means that we will automatically see more and more people with disabilities. Accessibility and people with disabilities has a huge business potential in the future. People who fail to see this have been sleeping for too long, in my opinion. Okay, yeah. And it's good to understand that you are even you know, widening the scope and that, that you say, okay, there are, this is not only a question where technology could not only uh, help to take down barriers for uh, disabled people, but also um, for elderly people or for, for children. Um, so this is, as you said, it is not only about the 10% where technology could do good. Um, there is a wider range um, that includes uh, even more uh, people and individuals um, and you know could you give us a, a good example for a technology that is in fact inclusion ready where you really think everything's done and this is really inclusion ready technology not really not really <laughs> okay so for everyone in the room here and in the audience which is working in uh, companies which are producing goods and services, this should be uh, you know, an important message to you that there is room for improvement, so to say, a lot of room for improvement to do things better. Um, thank you very much, Kirsten, um, for this interview. Um, finally, um, what are your next plans? Um, you have uh, ended your professional sports career, so to say, but I think um, you still have athletic goals, I assume. You are a very sporty person. And um, uh, are you still in the water every day? Not every day. Not I try every. to do three to five times a week. Yeah. Um, because always I do have athletic goals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This keeps me relaxed between my ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something inclusion because everybody partic participated uh, of this. Yeah, absolutely. So it was great talking to you. Thank you very much for your um, insights and your um, specific perspective that you shared with us. Um, and, um, you know, it is, it is um, always a great pleasure to meet someone with such an impressive uh, track record in, in uh, athletics. And it's also good to understand your perspective on the topics that we are talking about here, um, about these technologies and, and the impact that technologies might have in the future on tearing down barriers for certain groups of users, not only disabled persons, but a wider range of groups of users. Um, and I think we, we learned a lot from your perspective and take the message with us. So thank you very much for being here. And um, we have enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for my bad English. It was, it was very good. <laughs> it was very good. Stay with me. Um, do we have questions from the audience? There's a question. So I, I can help with translation if you want. Yeah. Uh, it's Roland Hussein uh, from Toronto. So I'm from Toronto and um, we know access. I think the government has done a fabulous job in giving access to people with needs. Um, as we landed at um, the airport here in Frankfurt, um, I was amazed that we had to go downstairs and for a modern city, a modern airport, that was a bit of a surprise. So how do you get a person with disability up to the plane and down from the plane? I took my wife to yesterday to the train station here and big heavy doors, not any of them were automatically operating for a handicapped person. Mm -hmm. uh, the hotel, Festale. So, in fact, uh, I saw more opportunities to make things accessible. And in Toronto, you'll hardly see that. They've really done a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. So, Frankfurt, Germany may be lacking tremendously. Mm -hmm. That's really a big problem. All the public stations, airports, and um, everything like this. Um, they are a special mobile to came to the gate and pick me up. So I... Um, uh, elevated or lifted up. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I'm always um, pre-boarding. Mm -hmm. And I have to sit um, when we land 
as the last person to get out of the plate. Yeah, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's strange, but it's, it's help, so it's okay when the help is there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to call the special persons mm -hmm. and it takes a long time that they came because many people, many planes here in Frankfurt, Munich, Hamburg, Berlin, is, is everything the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe one question back from the stage to the audience, um, because you're from Canada and, and Kirsten mentioned Canada and you, you agree that things in Canada are better. Do, can, you, can you tell us the reason for that? Is this regulation or...? I, I, I think it's regulation and I think it's, um, it's cultural. It's a caring culture mm -hmm. and um, an equality. They believe that everybody has a right. Uh, yeah. In your situation, you're disadvantaged because if you come on last and you get off last, that's a disadvantage, mm -hmm. and so everyone should have the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. what, what, was, what was first in Canada? The mentality, the mindset of the people, and the regulation simply followed it? Or was your experience, or is your experience that regulation set the pace and then developed a mentality? I, I think the people are caring people, mm -hmm. and the regulation was just to, to formalize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay. you know, so I, and it seemed to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Can I tell you a little story? Sure. So I do it in German, please translate. I, I try um, my best. <laughs> wenn man den Flug bucht, mm -hmm. um, und das macht man online, mm -hmm. ich in diesem Fall, dann ist es nicht möglich anzugeben, ich sitze im Rollstuhl, der ist faltbar, der wiegt so und so viel. Mm -hmm. um, das heißt also, ich muss sowieso, ich kann nicht dieses um, Speed-Checking machen, Online-Checking, ich muss immer zum Schalter, mm -hmm. alleine schon, weil ich für den Rollstuhl ein Label brauche. Mm -hmm. Um, und werde immer angesprochen, Frau Brun, Ihr Rollstuhl ist ja gar nicht angemeldet. Wo ich mhm. dann immer sage, das geht nicht online. Mhm. Machen Sie es möglich und ich mache es. Ja. Schon gesprochen mit der Lufthansa. Lufthansa ist ja auch Sponsor für Paralympik und Olympische mhm. Athleten. Und es ist aufgrund des Datenschutzes in Deutschland nicht möglich, dass die Daten gespeichert werden. Auch wenn ich ausdrücklich sage, ich möchte das, damit ich mich nicht jedes Mal erklären muss. Okay. Und das ist ein Prozess, ja. und den kämpfe ich jetzt schon 25 Jahre lang. Ich werde es auch noch weitermachen, mhm. aber es ist echt traurig. Yeah. Please don't give up, you know. It's ja. <laughs> the story is, uh, the story is that um, when, when Kirsten uh, flies um, uh, in, in Germany, most of the time, obviously, in Germany you fly with Lufthansa, and, um, and when, she, when she books a ticket, uh, she cannot um, register as a person with, uh, with uh, special needs. So there is no, no field or so where you can type in, I have a wheelchair and the weight of this wheelchair is so and so kilogram and so. And so all these informations cannot be transferred to the airline up front and that leads then to a complex process when you come to the airport because you cannot do online check-in, you cannot do automatic check-in, you need to go to the desk or to the counter and, and then you are uh, asked, so why have you registered why have you checked in for your for your wheelchair as well? And then you're saying I cannot <laughs> because there is no field. And the question is why is there no field? Um, is for data protection yeah. uh, and and data security uh, uh, reasons that Lufthansa or other companies maybe as well. So do. Always to not same. only blame Lufthansa here, um, uh, are not allowed, or think, or know, or whatever, are not allowed to, to, um, to get this data, and store this data, and manage this data for data protection reasons. So it's strange from time to time that, um, you know, in a, my personal view, but this is only a very personal remark, in a very over-regulated system, um, from time to time regulations that apply well to one scenario, uh, you know, lead to completely disaster in other scenarios, and this is, I think, a good example for that so yeah it is um, it's a it's a um, it's an impressive story because this exactly explains uh, where these these type of problems start and end yeah. yeah and and one one should think it should be easy to manage that but uh, it is not from time to time other questions from the audience This is not the case. So we are already... There. Oh, there is one. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're behind the camera, so therefore I, I wasn't able to see it. So, hello, good morning. My name is Jens Geiko. I'm here from DKE. Uh, and here we are on the IEC general meeting, so obviously it's about standardization. And uh, in the previous days, we had already here some session where, uh, for example, the young people, but also the, from the affiliate countries, they raised their, their voice and said, we, we need to include more the customer. And, and here we be, have to be very careful because when you talk about user, 
I, I guess, uh, Kirsten, you're not a, a user of standards, so, so maybe if you want to purchase, of course, you can buy and read. Uh, but for sure, you <laughs> and all here in the room, we are a user of products yeah. based on standards. Mm -hmm. And and so far, the, the, the question uh, which was discussed in the previous day, and I think for your situation, it's also very relevant, is how can we include the, the customer's voice in the standardization process? And, and do you think, uh, or are you aware of, uh, of a procedure to bring in, in your specific requirements uh, in for products, uh, or do you have a proposal how we can improve this? Mm -hmm. um, I'll do it again in Deutsch. Also in allererster Instanz brauchen wir in diesen Gremien, die Entscheidungsbefugnis haben, einfach Betroffene, so dass Betroffene sagen, was nötig ist. Und das heißt nicht, dass man jetzt ähm, eine Quote nimmt und man nimmt jetzt eine Kirsten Brunner als Rollstuhlfahrerin und damit ist die die, die Menge der Behinderten abgedeckt. Nein, wir brauchen dann auch einen Blinden, wir brauchen einen ähm, mit einer Halbparese, einen spastischen Gelähmten, einen mit kognitiven Beeinträchtigungen. Das heißt also, man braucht da schon drei, vier verschiedene Personen, die jeweils ihren Part vertreten und sagen, was muss ich haben, damit ich klarkomme. Ähm, und das ist leider nicht gegeben. Wir haben immer noch in den verschiedensten Gremien, ähm, wo auch für junge Menschen Prozesse und Programme entwickelt werden, wo aber ältere Menschen entscheiden, was für Jüngere nötig ist. Und das kann nicht funktionieren. Ähm, also ich kann auch nicht für Blinde sprechen. Das muss der Blinde dann selber machen. Und das ist, glaube ich, genau der Punkt. Dass viele Menschen glauben, sie haben das studiert und dadurch sind sie in der Theorie perfekt, was sie auch bestimmt sind. Aber dazu gehört das Erleben, das Fühlen und die Erfahrung. Und die haben nur die Betroffenen. Ich denke, die Antwort ist to the point and exactly what you what you uh, mentioned with your question as well, the, the, the voice of the user of the product uh, should be heard in the process of product design very initially. And I think this is where, where you point out that this is exactly the point that's not happening right now or it's not happening in an appropriate way. And I think a good example for, to, to take away is that if we, if we uh, want to make the voice of disabled persons as product users uh, give more give more power, then it's even not enough to have one disabled person with one special disability mm -hmm. in such processes, embedded or integrated in such processes, because your needs are different from uh, people with other disabilities, for exactly. blind people yeah. or uh, you know various types of disabilities. And um, so this is a this is a complex um, a complex project. But you know you are as a as a uh, person with a lot of, you know, media coverage and a lot of contacts and network. And so, um, for example, um, does a car making company ever invited you to join a council of people or so that are developing the next car? Does That's this okay. ever happen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does, does this ever happen so far? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. For sure. Okay, yeah. yeah. And okay. I hope it will going further. Yeah. So okay. we have to work on it. Okay. So yeah. there are signs of hope, at least, so to say, Absolute. which is good. Absolute. And we we always, you know, look for positive messaging uh, here. And 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 therefore, I'm 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 very happy that you shared your experiences again, and that um, there are also at least a few points where positive signals maybe um, maybe um, uh, maybe there, and 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 uh, maybe it's only a starting point. Point, but at least it's a starting point from from where things can can uh, get better. Correct. Thank may, you very may much. I short interrupt also oh, for, for uh, I just can speak for DKE. So for the German electrotechnical standardization, you are always invited. Uh, so and if there's any problem, please let me know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got very it. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> This is, this is how it should go, per, obviously. Thank you very much for this invitation. Good. Thank you, Kirsten, again. Um, I think um, we are from here, we are moving directly to the panel, to the closing panel. Yes, we have uh, roughly uh, 20 minutes left, so we need two more, um, uh, two more boxes here with us. Stay, stay where we yeah. are, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please stay with us here on stage. Okay. Uh, we, let, let's do it. Let's put one over here because, you know, most of the audience can then better see us. Um, and may I ask the other um, speakers again to come on stage. Martina Mara, Sandro Geiken, please join us here for some, you know, closing thoughts and ideas on um, where you like. 
Okay, so and do, do we have a second microphone for Zandu? Oh, oh, you're, you're mic'd as well. Okay, perfect, great. Okay, so um, yeah, we, we have touched, you know, such a, a um, um, variety of aspects, psychological aspects, uh, the voice of the customer, the voice of the user from a very special perspective, the security elements. So, um, and, uh, you know, I would, I would like to, to ask uh, all of you that um, what, are the, what are the strongest uh, recommendations, so to say, um, you would like to give to the audience here and say, okay, if you if you should take away one key thing that could really improve the future of standardization with respect to safety, um, uh, what is the key recommendation you would give from your special perspective? Maybe, Sandro, you could start. Okay, well, uh, I have no interest in uh, furthering the future of standardization, but I want standardization to help my future and the future yeah. of uh, mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, my recommendation to standardization would be to really take care of the security problem because there's so little liability, there's so little standardization. The few things we have in certificates and, and mm -hmm. think don't work, they take too long, bureaucracy is terrible. Um, so this, there's a lot to do. It's, it's really like a big field where nothing has been done. I mean, one ridiculous example is that the software industry is not liable for anything they do mm -hmm. bad. I mean, they're not liable for software vulnerabilities, even if those are known to be uh, avoidable for 30 years or something. Yeah. And uh, when some, for instance, Siemens sells a critical infrastructure to some export country and there is SAP incorporated mm -hmm. in it, and then the SAP gets hacked and the Siemens thing blows up, Siemens is liable. Yeah. Because SAP SAP says, well, I'm a software industry, I'm not liable for anything. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I think the only two industries who, who, who uh, call the, the customers users and who are not liable for anything is drug cartels and the IT industry. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that the case? I mean, this is clearly a lack of standardization. Okay, yeah, very, very good point and, and, uh, um, and clear message. Thank you for that. Um, will you like to go on? Yeah, um, I'm very much impressed by both of your talks. And I think we, we brought in very different perspectives, but um, I, I know that, you know, the security issues that you talked about, they, they also represent fears of, <laughs> of users. And mm. um, I, I worked a lot with the uh, car industry on human-car interaction, completely different field <laughs> or perspective than yours and I know that people you know people always ask about um, yeah but is there a possibility that, that that the robot car will be hacked so this is really a fear yeah mm -hmm. and this needs to be addressed and taken seriously and uh, I think what we can take away from from this session as one keyword again <laughs> is this interdisciplinarity that we need to link people from different backgrounds and that we need to cooperate with each other even more and um, many many disciplines have um, may have points for for standardization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially yours mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope but but uh, what we also need to do I think in the end is to provide some positive vision of the future um, because if we only uh, address the dystopian mm -hmm. image, mm -hmm. um, doesn't make things better in the end. So we need to collaborate <laughs> to to work on positive visions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Kirsten, if you like in German. Yeah. <laughs> In English, maybe I try. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> open your mind. Open your mind for inclusion, for people with disability, for older people, young people, and trust in the human talents. Mm -hmm. Because um, when we do so many technology and when we have so many technology, maybe we forget what we can really do. And um, especially for the young people, the young person. And talk about... Um, stories, bad stories, um, stories about death, uh, sickness, um, accidents, um, and the real life. That's what the young people make um, wise, mm -hmm. wise, mm -hmm. wise. Um, and prepare for their life. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have questions from the audience to the panel? 
Okay, again. <laughs> Just another invitation. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting crowded. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I couldn't uh, attend all uh, the, the beginning of your speak, but for this uh, security issue, I mean, when I was, uh, let's say, when I came in, in touch with computers first, there have been no viruses and this stuff, but then there came, and then a lot of people say this security by uh, conspicuity uh, approach, and, and then uh, I learned that will not work. Uh, um, I, I think what we try to establish within the, the IAC world is, is really uh, to achieve security by transparency and by, by establishing processes. And, and I, I, I believe that the guys from the uh, uh, Industry 4.0, that's how we call it in Germany, or in, uh, Internet of Things uh, community for the industrial applications, um, they understood the, the basic message behind it but of course uh, we are open for any advice to go more in detail how to organize it and how to to achieve it and and uh, so what we try to bring in is to say uh, in classical safety safety is a, is a state of a product a product is safe or not safe but security is a process and we try to teach the people please organize the process mm -hmm. but maybe there's an even better idea and if there's a safe computer maybe once we can say okay again security is a state again uh, or <laughs> yeah, well, what I can tell you from, from my experience and the, the general experiences of the hacking community and the uh, computer science people working in security with smart factory people, smart car people, uh, we measure the quality of the attempts by what the fuck per minute. Uh, so uh, usually the, the, most of the ideas are ridiculous and, and so we've, we've met very large companies with a lot of money who had completely ridiculous outlandish ideas on how they should do security and the regulators and the standardization communities are usually lagging far behind these guys already. So they, they take much longer. Sometimes they can surprise us in a good way uh, if they have good people, good leadership and, and a good vision of, of what they're supposed to do. And then, then sometimes something good comes out of that and it, it puts the right incentive into the market to get into the right direction. Uh, but right now, or the industry 4.0 community is not on a good path. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so just uh, two, three comments. And the uh, first one on security. Um, I think you will also say that um, you can have the best systems, but you have to be vigilant every minute of the day because people will always try to puncture it and find ways around it. So you have to be vigilant. Uh, so it's, that's, that, that's the human part of it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, when you opened the presentation, you said this is a nice forum. And I totally agree, and congratulations to Jens and his team for putting this together. Um, if I were to do any one thing better, I would have backrests. Because <laughs> I, cre <laughs> I created my own backrests for older guys. Uh, we need a bit of support. So ergonomically, it needs a little bit of touching. But it's a great, I, I like the circle, I like the environment. And um, you know, for um, uh, the speaker on, on robotics, and for all of the speakers, um, um, you've got to look at two broad populations. One is on demographics. Um, you know, the things we do, can it apply to everybody? You all touched on it. Um, because ever so often we do things and we can leave out a large portion of the demographic. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, when you look at all of the things we talked about over the past four or five days, um, I worry that we are leaving out a large part of the world on the lower developing economies because we speak this language, we talk about the tools and the systems and we are leaving out 50% of the world and how do we, how do we bring them in? Um, congratulations again to um, IEC in that they have an office in Kenya, I heard, which is a good thing. So how do you reach out deeper into Africa, deeper into South America and deeper into the Far East? Because um, we are creating stuff for the developed world and leaving out 50% of the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Any, any comments on that? Is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, short comment, yeah. Um, at Ars Electronic, uh, um, the institution I work in Linz, Austria, we, we try to reach out, uh, we invite um, 
hackers, makers uh, from all over the world and it's always uh, great to see how creative people get, especially in the areas of the world uh, that are not that wealthy. For example, just a month ago we had guys from Fab Labs, um, Egypt and Iran um, as guests and um, some makers from, from Africa who built uh, incredibly cheap um, new ways uh, to um, develop processes, for example, and we can learn a lot from these uh, also grassroots um, activists. Um, so it's also good to, to get in, in more dialogue with um, people from, from these regions of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, just a, a quick comment, because I'm, I'm working for NATO. One of the things I do is to develop the cyber defense strategy nat national for Jordan, and it turned out that the uh, smaller, less developed nations actually have great opportunities to get security right because they haven't done so many things wrong. So uh, if they start from scratch to begin with, with IT and all these things, they can th do a proper start and, and do proper thinking about this, and they don't have to buy all this legacy problem stuff. So that's, uh, for, for many of them, it's actually an opportunity uh, coming to this game, and some of them could develop their own industrial capabilities because they're not tied that closely and that, that uh, mm -hmm. nitty-gritty uh, mm -hmm. to path dependencies. Mm -hmm. You have to advise them. I have what? You have to advise them because yeah, send me. Microsoft will sell them the old stuff, but you have to tell them, be careful. Uh, I'm happy to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. But less, less legacy, obviously a big opportunity. And I think in, in times as if we are in, where everything is changing so fast, and many explore and many uh, uh, learn that less legacy is a big opportunity for many things because it makes change easier. Yeah. It makes change easier, it makes restart, rethink, reinvention easier. And this is maybe, uh, uh, maybe the, the closing remark, uh, since we are running out of time a little bit. If there are no other questions in, in the audience, I will have last round. No, no more questions left. I think there are many questions left and many impressions everyone can take away here from these uh, wonderful three speakers. And I want to thank again all of you three for your participation here and for the great insight you shared with us and, and the, the openness to, to stay with us here the full time and asking questions. This is, this is really great and makes it particularly valuable. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, ask the audience for a big hand for all three of you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all side, also from my side uh, for the organizers uh, to create a stage like that. Um, it's not only uh, you know, physically a nice stage and it looks good and it's an interesting and good experience to be here. It's also an interesting exchange of ideas and very different perspectives. And I was, I was curious to see this morning how this will work out. And I personally think it worked out well because of you and, and because of you, obviously, and your, your guiding questions and, and inputs. Uh, this was a good experience and it showed really that this what I think all of you three said that we need to think think out of the silo. We need to come across the traditional barriers and borderlines of the silos where our industries and, and, and the day-to-day the -day reality is organized. And we can overcome that and we need to overcome that if we want to use technology in particular respect for better results in safety, uh, for tearing down barriers when it comes to uh, accessibility and inclusion, when it comes to deal with the demographic element that you mentioned again, uh, which is so important, and, and, and also when we want to reach out successfully to not only the maybe only 20% or so of the, of the people uh, on this planet that are living in developed countries, if we want to reach out to the others as well, then thinking out of the box, reinventing is absolutely key. I think this is the key message that we all can take away from that stage. And I'm, was, I'm very happy that we have been able to, uh, to uh, get that together here and, and uh, share this time uh, uh, together in this room and in this wonderful arena. Thank you very much for being here. And I wish all of you a nice remaining day here in Frankfurt. And I think many of you will travel home this afternoon and tonight. So for all of you, safe travels. Thank you very much. IEC General Meeting 2016. Connecting communities. Reinvent standardization.